key Come lay the spell at his feet He has done great things See what the Savior has done See how his love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh deal of heaven You conquer the grave you free it, free captive, and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. You're dancing, your freedom, awaken alive, oh Jesus, a Savior, in name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Salvation 
said the rock won't move No, the rock won't move When darkness seems to hide its face Our rest in its unchanging grace The rock won't move No, the rock won't move On Christ the solid rock I stand on the ground The sinking sand The rock won't move No, the rock won't move When darkness seems to hide its face Our rest in its unchanging The rock won't move and his love can't be undone The rock of our salvation oh. 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 The rock of our salvation I stand on love the crown and sink and sand the rock won't move No the rock won't move morning everybody and welcome to our last week of our atypical series last week we talked about having difficult conversations with our families and today we're going to build right on that and we'll be talking about forgiveness okay so we've all needed to forgive or be forgiven by a family member and no family is perfect because families are just people and people are never perfect right in every family people hurt each other that's just what happens, okay? But when typical families hurt each other, they respond with, with bitterness, anger, or revenge. Atypical, in the sense that we're using the term, atypical families hurt each other too. But instead of pursuing revenge, they pursue forgiveness, okay? It's different. We've been saying that there is no family God can't use. Your family can be used by God to do atypical things in the world, but how? Relationships, like friendships, siblings, parents, whatever, it's hard to say sorry when we're in those relationships, right? Like, we like to think that, we, uh, that what we did was right all the time, that everything we do is right. In fact, there are the three hardest things to say to someone when you're in any type of relationship, and they are, I was wrong, I'm sorry, and Worcestershire sauce. And that is the case with me too. See, I struggle with what I call being kind of dumb, okay? And I get really upset when I get a small notion of anything not going my way. Then I fly off the handle before all the details are out. It makes me look like a fool, okay? Um, I look stupid. And then I have to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry. And I've gotten better at it since I've been married. In fact, now when I say something hurtful that I really didn't mean, I'll apologize pretty much right away. For instance, 
I could say, I can't believe you would spend all that money. You are so dumb and fat, and you're not fat or dumb. I'm just angry, and this is all coming out right now, and I'm sorry. See, it's become easier for me to say I'm sorry, but really only to one person. My absolutely perfect human wife, Emily. I can remember growing up with my sister, Kara, and I was just the worst, okay? I was better than her at pretty much everything that didn't matter, like sports, but she was always better than me at school and, like, being a good person and stuff. Like, you know, stuff that actually does matter. I would relentlessly make fun of her for being unathletic and nerdy and one time she got a really short haircut and I was like you look like a boy you look like a boy and she didn't like that at all she cried and I had to apologize and it sucked but here's the thing I never thought I really needed to apologize however when she would say anything mean to me or about me I would be so hurt so torn apart that I would not talk to her until she said sorry. Or I would demand an apology. And I would scream until I got mom and dad to force her to apologize to me. And no one likes apologizing and no one likes having to forgive somebody either. Especially a family member because we think, well, they're my family. They have to love me. So I may as well treat them like crap. See, at some point... We all need to forgive or be forgiven by our families. And sometimes, forgiving our family members is easy, but when a person has deeply hurt us, forgiveness can be much more difficult. Typical families let their hurts and offenses go unresolved until they result in bitterness, broken relationships, or even revenge. But atypical families know that their relationships with their families are too valuable to lose. So far in this series, we've met the family of Adam and Eve, the family of their descendant Abraham, and the family of Abraham's grandsons, Jacob and Esau. Today, I want to introduce you to another generation of the same family, Jacob's son, Joseph, and his brothers. So we've talked about Joseph before, so you may be familiar with his story, like he's got a crazy cool coat, uh, but today, we're going to focus specifically on Joseph's relationship with his family. So let's get a quick overview of Joseph's story, and then we'll look more closely at the details. So Jacob goes on from there to have 12 sons, big family. But Jacob loves his 11th son, Joseph, way more than all the others. And so he gives him the special Technicolor dream coat. And his brothers, because of this, come to hate him. So much so that they plan on killing him. But they don't. They instead just sell him as a slave down in Egypt. Now, while in Egypt, through this crazy series of events, Joseph goes from being in a prison cell to becoming the second in command there. And so later on, the, the whole Middle East falls into this food shortage. And Joseph's brothers, they come down to Egypt looking for food. And then when they get there, who should they find as the ruler of the whole land? It's Joseph, that guy they sold into slavery. But he actually saves them from starving to death. And so here you have it. These are the great-grandchildren of Abraham who have done this heinous act to their brother, but God has transformed their evil into something good. And that's exactly what Joseph says here in the last paragraph of the entire book. He says, you guys planned all of this for evil, but God planned it for good to save people's lives. Now these words, they conclude the book because they actually summarize the message of the whole story so far. Humans keep choosing evil and we are thinking they're, they're screwing up God's plan, but he keeps turning their evil back into good. And somehow he's going to use this family to restore humanity back to the garden. Now that we have the big picture, let's pay closer attention to Joseph's relationship with his family, okay? And we'll see this in Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to read that to you right now, okay? Meanwhile, Jacob had settled down where his father had lived, the land of Canaan. This is the story of Jacob. The story continues with Joseph, 17 years old at the time, helping out his brothers in the herding of the flocks. These were his half-brothers, actually, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. And Joseph brought his father bad reports on them. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age, okay? And he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. You may have 
called a technicolor coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him, and they wouldn't even speak to him. And Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat, and all of a sudden my bundle stood up, and your bundle circled it and bowed down to mine. And his brother said, so you're going to rule us? You're going to boss us around? And they hated him more than ever because of his dreams and the way that he talked to them. He had another dream and told this one also to his brothers. He said, I dreamed another dream. The sun and the moon and 11 stars all bowed down to me. And when he told it to his father and brothers, his father reprimanded him. What's wrong? Or what's with all this dreaming? Am I and your mother and your brothers all supposed to bow down to you? Now his brothers were really jealous, but his father brooded over the whole business. Let's think about these family dynamics here. Joseph is his father's favorite, clearly, okay? And he isn't quiet about it. Joseph decides it's a good idea to tell his brothers that someday they'll all serve him. For obvious reasons, his brothers did not like this, okay? And I'm not defending what Joseph's brothers did to him, but let's be clear, Joseph wasn't totally innocent, okay? He was arrogant, and he was a little obnoxious. So one day, Joseph's brothers are working hard in the fields, and Joseph heads out to meet them, wearing his fancy coat. And the story continues in Genesis 37, 18 through 36. It says, they spotted him off in the distance. By the time he got to them, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. The brothers were saying, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these old cisterns. We can say that a vicious animal ate him up. We'll see what his dreams amount to. Reuben heard the brother talking and intervened to save him. We're not going to kill him. No murder. Go ahead and throw him in the cistern out here in the wild, but don't hurt him. Reuben planned to go back later and get him out and take him back to his father. But when Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing and grabbed him and threw him into a cistern. So the cistern was dry and there was no water in it. Okay. And then they sat down to eat their supper. Looking up, they saw a grand caravan of Ishmaelites on their way from Gilead. Their camels loaded with spices, ointments, and perfumes to sell in Egypt. And Judah said, Brothers, what are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let's not kill him. He is, after all, our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. At the time, the Midianite traders were all passing by. His brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. Later, Reuben came back and went to the cistern. No Joseph. He ripped his clothes in despair. He was beside himself. He went to his brothers. The boy's gone. What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's coat, butchered a goat, and dipped the coat in the goat's blood. They took the fancy coat back to their father and said, We found this. Look it over. Do you think it's Joseph's coat? He recognized it at once and he said, My son's coat. A wild animal has eaten him. He was torn limb from limb. Jacob tore his clothes in grief, dressed in rough burlap, and mourned his son a long, long time. His sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused their comfort. He said, I'll go to the grave mourning my son. Oh, how his father wept for him. 
In Egypt, the Midianites sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, manager of his household affairs. Imagine you and your siblings are outside sweating in the sun when you're hard at work. Your brother, who's your dad's favorite, comes strutting over to you wearing his fanciest and most expensive clothes while you're covered in sweat and dirt. Clearly, he has not come to help you. He did not come to lend you a hand. Joseph's brothers are so tired of Joseph, his attitude, his favorite status, and his dreams about how he would someday be their ruler in anger and jealousy, they throw Joseph into a well. They stage his death and they sell him into slavery. See, I've needed to forgive family members before, but I've never had to give, forgive anyone for something like this. Joseph may have had an attitude problem. He may have been a little arrogant, but this kind of retaliation from his brothers was just cruel. And you already know how the story ends. Joseph saves the lives of his brothers and forgives them for what they did to him. And Joseph forgives his brothers. But when their father Jacob dies, the brothers get scared that Joseph will change his mind and try and get revenge. See, they don't know what he'll do. They know that they haven't deserved the forgiveness and kindness that Joseph had given to them. So they're scared. And if we continue on the story of Joseph in Genesis 50, we read that after burying his father, Joseph went back to Egypt. All his brothers who had come with him to bury his father returned with him. And after the funeral, Joseph's brothers talked among themselves. What if Joseph is carrying a grudge and decides to pay us back for all the wrong we did him? So they sent Joseph a message. It said this, Before his death, your father gave this command. Tell Joseph, forgive your brother's sin, all that wrongdoing. They did treat you very badly. Will you do it? Will you forgive the sins of the servants of your father's God? And when Joseph received their message, he wept. Okay, He didn't just cry. He broke down and wept. Then the brothers went into prison. or went. <laughs> then the brothers went in person to him threw themselves on the ground before him and said, We will be your slaves. Joseph replied, Don't be afraid. Do I act for God? Don't you see? You planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good, as you will see all around you right now. Life for many people. Easy now. You have nothing to fear. I'll take care of you and your children. He reassured them, speaking with them heart to heart. So Joseph had every reason to be angry at his brothers, but Joseph chose forgiveness instead of bitterness. Many years after Joseph forgave his brothers, Jesus preached the sermon to a group of his followers. And last week, we read part of that sermon about having tough conversations, so we're going to read the next part. It's Matthew 18, 21 through 22. It's real short. At that point, Peter got up to the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? And Jesus replied, Seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. Jesus goes on to tell a parable. Jesus goes on to tell a parable about a man who had been forgiven of a huge debt. It was forgiveness he didn't deserve. But when someone asked the same man to forgive them of their debt, he refused. Here was Jesus' point. God has forgiven you of so much, so give some of that forgiveness to each other. The kind of forgiveness Joseph showed his brothers is not typical. It's hard to understand. But that's the kind of forgiveness God has shown us through Jesus. And throughout this series, we've been saying that if you want God to use your family to do atypical things, sometimes you have to be the first person in your family to do something atypical. And that's what Joseph did. And it's what Jesus teaches us to do. And when you've been hurt by someone in your family, the typical response is to get bitter or take revenge or throw them in a cistern. But Joseph chose to do the atypical thing. He showed his brothers forgiveness, kindness, and compassion. 
atypical families forgive each other. In just a second, I'm going to share some action steps that we can all take toward forgiveness. But first, I want to acknowledge that this conversation might be confusing to some people in the watching. You might have a family member who has hurt you so deeply or so repeatedly that the idea of forgiving them like Joseph forgave his brother seems impossible. Let me be clear. If anyone in your family or not in your family has hurt you or continues to hurt you physically, emotionally, sexually, this conversation is not for you. If this is your story, God is not telling you to just move on and be nice to them or protect them from the consequences of their actions. That's not the point of this conversation. I need you to hear that. If this is your story, here's what I want you to do. Tell an adult today. Don't hesitate. But if that's not your story, let's keep talking. Just like forgiveness changed Joseph and his family for the better, being eager to forgive can change your family for the better Two. So how do you forgive a family member when they've hurt you? Forgiveness doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be cloudy. It can be as simple as admitting you've been hurt. I mean, you, you're telling God you need help to forgive them. Asking God to heal the parts of your heart that have been hurt. Choosing to focus on moving forward instead of what happened in the past. Forgiving yourself and asking for forgiveness, if you need to, for the part you played in what happened. So think right now about a family member you need to forgive. Now imagine how you and your family could be transformed if you were willing to choose forgiveness over bitterness or revenge. How do you think forgiveness could change your attitude or perspective? How do you think forgiveness could change the person you're fighting with? How do you think forgiveness could begin to change your family's pattern of behavior in the long term? Forgiveness is tough. It's hard. But isn't it amazing that we get to forgive others in the same way God has forgiven us? See, right now, here's what I'd like you to do, okay? Um, identify someone in your family you need to forgive. Write their name down in your notes on your phone or on some paper and pray for them as you do it, okay? Write down someone's name that you need to forgive. Think about why you want to forgive them. Is it because you're tired of feeling angry all the time? Is it because you don't want to become bitter? Is it because you miss having a close relationship with them? If it is, any of those things or whatever it is, write that down too. Keep this somewhere you can see it. Let it be a reminder of your commitment to forgive instead of take revenge. Forgiveness is often a process. So while you learn to forgive, you may need to be reminded of why it's worth it to forgive. See, forgiveness is something that we can offer to those who have hurt us, but it's also a gift we give ourselves. Unforgiveness leaves to us feeling bitter, angry, and closed off to others. So harboring hate and anger toward our, our, our enemies is like eating rat poison and expecting the rat to die. But when we let God help us forgive, we find healing, hope, and freedom. We've talked a lot about difficult things in the last few weeks. That's because our families can be pretty difficult. But our imperfect families aren't hopeless. Like Adam and Eve, not-so-typical families can be used by God. Like Abraham and Lot, not-so-typical families pray for each other. Like Jacob and Esau, not-so-typical family, families have tough conversations. Like Joseph and his brothers, not-so-typical families forgive each other. It is not your job to fix your family. But if you want to see your family be used by God to do atypical things in the world, you do have a role to play. Pray for your family. Have tough conversations with them and forgive your family. When it comes to your family, don't be typical.
I count on one thing The same God that never fails When I fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley And yes, I will bless your name Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days Oh, yes, I will I count on one thing The same God who never fails When I fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out